Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we're bringing on John Sheeran because we needed someone who can wear 15,000 hats at once. And John, very capable of doing that, the director of trading at FanDuel Sportsbook. We're going to talk NBA and NHL playoffs, the difficulties of bookmaking for changing circumstances with fans and stuff like that. And of course, John's a big horse racing guy. So we're going to talk some Belmont at the end as well. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. And Ed, NBA playoffs in full swing. We got changes with the Celtics, with their management uh, all up in flames. We got yep. the Suns Lakers series with Anthony Davis hurt, CP3 maybe not not a full health. It's a, a very interesting time to be a sports fan. And I say interesting on purpose because I, I can't say it's fun because it's a lot of weird stuff going on. We, you know, just a lot of stuff at play right now. Yeah, there certainly is a lot of stuff on play at play. Um, I've, I've actually taken kind of an interest in the, this Lakers sun series for, for many reasons. Uh, you know, not to mention the future I have on the Lakers because of uh, <laughs> Drew Dinzik the other week. Yep. So, um, so, yeah, a lot of interesting things going on. I'll be talking about that a little bit later in, in covering the future. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's you know, I think some of these series are kind of easy when everyone's healthy and you're bouncing back between, you know, two evenly matched teams, you know, going back and forth between home courts. Like, you know, we're, we're seeing a couple of those series in terms of Atlanta and New York and, and Denver and Portland, and the spreads are kind of boring, right? <laughs> Not so in Lakers yeah. Suns. No, it's been seesawing back and forth for legitimate reasons, like it should be doing so. But we're going to talk to John Sheeran about setting those prices for that series, how things, where things stand right now, about the NBA playoffs in general, about home court, all that stuff. And of course, no better person to discuss that than John Sheeran, the director of trading at FanDuel Sports. But you can find him on Twitter at jsheeran1981. Also want to remind you, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are here once every week during the football offseason. Back again next week, potentially later in the week. Uh, so make sure you are subscribed to get that podcast right as it goes into your feeds, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. No matter where you listen, you can find us there. Before we get to John, though, got to go back to the last week. We talked some hockey. We talked some NASCAR heading into last week's weekend. Covering the past. Last week, we had Dom Lucigen on to talk about the NHL playoffs. You can find him at The Athletic and on Twitter, at Dom Lucigen. We talked about the Avalanche's Stanley Cup odds. At the time we talked to Dom, they were plus 270. They're now down to plus 150. So hopefully you got on when Dom talked about them last week. We also discussed some individual games that night on Wednesday. Dom was on the money line for Pittsburgh, Minnesota, and Tampa Bay. And Tampa Bay and Minnesota both won, I believe, via shutout. Tampa Bay was minus 145 in the money line. Minnesota was plus 19. Pittsburgh lost, but as long as you had Tampa Bay and Minnesota, still a profitable day if you decide to pull the trigger and listen to Dom there. I had NASCAR for the Coca-Cola 600. I had uh, Matt Benedetto to finish top 10 at plus 225 and a William Byron outright at plus 1,600. The Di Benedetto one, for whatever reason, just never had a chance. It was weird. He was just slow to start the race, never was able to recover, finished 18th. So that one was weird. Byron, I do feel good about, though. He closed at 12 to 1, so good closing value. He was fast in practice and qualifying as expected. He ran up front the entire night. He had a third place average running position, which is actually even better than what he had when he won in Homestead. He just couldn't quite overcome his teammate, Kyle Larson. Larson led 327 out of 400 laps. Byron did pass him briefly in the third stage, but couldn't make that one stick. But if you told me that Someone I bet at 16 to 1 would close a 12 to 1 and have a third place average running position. I'd be ecstatic. I'd feel very good about that. So even though it didn't hit, I feel good about the process behind that one. For William Byron, 
Byron's number this week in Sonoma, pretty short, so I don't be I won't be going back there. But we'll talk more about Sonoma later on. We're also going to talk to John Sheeran about a bevy of topics in just one second. But first, the Belmont Stakes is coming up this weekend, and FanDuel Racing is helping you get in on the action. FanDuel will match your first deposit dollar for dollar up to 50 bucks when you open a new racing account. That is free money you can use to turn any race day into payday. There is no promo code needed. Just download the FanDuel Racing app, make your first deposit, and you are off to the races. The app is super easy to use, and most payouts occur in a matter of minutes. Start building your bankroll today and be ready for race day on Saturday. Download the FanDuel Racing app, make your first deposit, and get up to 50 bucks free on FanDuel. Go to racing.fanduel.com for more details. We'll talk about the Belmont, get a pick from John Sheeran, find him on Twitter at jsheeran1981. He is, of course, the director of trading at FanDuel Sportsbook. We'll talk some NBA and NHL, and of course, the Belmont with John. Covering the present. Let's bring John Sheeran into covering the spread once again to talk a whole lot of different topics. We got NBA and NHL playoffs. We got some horse racing because John, of course, well versed in horse racing, he gave us our intro to horse racing a year ago here on covering the spread. So, John, busy time of year for you. How are you doing today? Very well, Jim. Yeah, it's a crazy time right now. Not just uh, the ongoing sports and the playoffs, obviously in the NBA and the NHL, but. Uh, regular season MLB and trying to get ready for college and for NFL season. I believe I saw yesterday 100 days, so 99 days from today, the start of the NFL season, and yep. uh, it doesn't be long coming around. So uh, busy, but exciting time. Oh, the hey, John, 100 day thing is, is daunting. Hey, John, is there any time that's busier or less busy for you between like now, even though there's no football, which is probably your biggest handle, but there's obviously a lot of stuff going on in daily sports. Is there a busier or less busier time from your perspective? I mean, in theory, on paper, this should be our kind of getting into our quieter time when particularly once we get the postseason down to the last few uh, games. Uh, and then obviously it's just kind of trundle along with the MLB season. But the way the business has been and the way that, you know, product development uh, initiatives that we're on delivering new models for new sports uh, that we're excited about, that kind of has taken up all of the quiet time. So there, I don't think there is any more quiet times, uh, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely what it seems like in this day and age. Well, the tough part of that, John, is you're a big horse racing guy. We're talking about the Belmont later on, but like, have you found time to still get your like uh, your side hustle of some horse racing action in, or have you been too busy with NBA and NHL stuff to really dive into the more recreational stuff for you with horse racing? Yeah, it's been difficult to keep across it. Obviously, try and keep across the big races and particularly the three year olds as they progress through their uh, qualifiers and get onto the Triple Crown. Um, managed to get to the Preakness, uh, which was fun. Pimlico and uh, hopefully get to Belmont on Saturday so I'm doing enough don't feel sorry for me but it's been <laughs> it's been difficult to kind of keep my eye on the horses the way I would like to for sure absolutely well we'll talk about the Belmont here in just a bit but first do you want to talk to you about some of the stuff for you as you know someone who's helping set these lines and get stuff ready because obviously there's been an evolution over the past couple of months we've had vaccine rollouts increased fans as a result of that and that obviously plays a big dynamic, especially as we transition now into the postseason. So I want to ask you what that process was like in trying to keep up as a sports book, as as we saw capacities increasing, specifically I think for basketball more so than other stuff. What was it like for you trying to set lines when things were changing so much with something that does matter quite a bit? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Like you say, at the start of the pandemic the conversation was the other way what is the impact right. now of no fans and you know look we're all aware of the continual trend in you know the the or the drop in the value of home field or home court, court advantage in all pro sports we see it now with NBA with the reviews you know the officials I think they just do a much better job than they've ever done before but that said I think you know for me watching Nate McMillan in, in Madison Square Garden in uh, on the broadcast when he actually said you know, I'm struggling to hear you. I'm struggling for you guys to hear me when I'm given directions. I think that was probably the point where it resonated the most that actually, you know, we probably need to start, you know, adjusting and considering the advantage. And I think, look, it's it varies by every arena. We know that already. Uh, and I think Madison Square Garden has been a good, a good example of how uh, the fans can actually help their team and obviously impact the spread as a result. So it's a continual work in progress for us. 
uh, it's subjective as, a, as we all know, um, particularly in this scenario when we don't really know you know, the advantage or necessarily the amount of people that are going to be in some of the arenas and some are more noisy than others, as we said. So, uh, yeah, tough one to track, but look, don't feel sorry for us. I think the betters have the same problem posed. Well, I'm curious about the how it actually went down for you with the MSG game specifically, because that was the one where, it, for me too, you know, you kind of notice the impact of the crowd. Do you have like a meeting with other people at FanDuel Sportsbook and actually talk about, okay, how do we adjust for that? What's kind of the process for you in deciding how much you want to change things? Yeah, I mean, we look at the historics and the notes and the the numbers that we have, the hard facts that tell us exactly what we rate that home court to, to be worth. And then there's obviously a multiplier for situations, right? They hadn't won a game for eight years in the postseason. <laughs> you know, they're baying for blood, particularly that of Trey Young. <laughs> So I think there's just nuanced situation here that means you just have to rely on the experience that as a team we all have. And, you know, the, the head NBA trader, those guys have got so many years of experience, so many games under their belt that we've a lot of trust in them that they'll get a good feel for it, even if the number doesn't back it up. And, you know, that's considered in our line. But like I said, it's subjective. And I think it's a tough one to get everyone to agree to, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've definitely seen some discrepancies in, in the home court across different series. Uh, another thing that we're dealing with in the playoffs is getting these repeat matchups, right? So you see a couple teams play, a team like Milwaukee is dominating. How, what is your process for trying to adjust as the series goes on and uh, setting these spreads? Yeah, look, it's similar, right? Because it's pretty subjective in terms of how much of it is actually noise of a small sample size versus how much of it is actually the adjustments being made either in the game or, you know, how they match up against each other. Coaching advantages, for example, as well. Um, so it's a difficult one for us to justify and put an, an exact number on it. Uh, we, but the truth of the matter is we just rely so heavily on our base core ratings that the small adjustments that we do make, and we do make them, uh, are relatively minor, though, when you think about the matchups and how the series is progressing. You look at, you know, I think game one and two in Brooklyn was really interesting. The total was bet from 227 to 233 on game one. Obviously went massively under when both of them had a pretty sh poor shooting performance. And then in game two, the total was like 227. So it had adjusted down from being bet up six points back down to the initial point. And that was one that we felt pretty strongly, like betting the over... You know, the money that we saw, the movement and sharp play on the first total was still pretty relevant. And, you know, they yeah. didn't even get to 200 points. So they're the sort of adjustments we're looking to make. Uh, but like I said, they're pretty subjective and it can be very difficult to decipher uh, and understand what is noise against what is actual fact. For you, when you are in a situation like that where you are trying to decide the impact of you want to take from one game, is your inclination to default to your priors, default to that baseline you were talking about, and kind of trust the numbers you have? Absolutely. I mean, otherwise, you know, you just find yourself swaying from game to game so <laughs> much that you really don't know where you lie. And like I said, for us, the vast majority, 98% of it will be relying on our core ratings trying to make the adjustments that yeah. we can for some of the situational stuff and then add the layer on top of the subjective narrative that, you know, the guys have a lot of experience and value add uh, from that perspective. Right. And there's just so much randomness in shooting. I'm, I'm not sure if that exactly was the case in, in game one of the Brooklyn series, but, you know, we, we know just how random, especially three point shooting is. So I think, you know, you, you do need to be cautious of like the small sample size for sure. Um, I, we did also want to ask you about the, the Suns-Lakers series. The Suns went up 3-2 um, with a big game. Uh, Lakers without Anthony Davis. Uh, they're now minus 290 to knock off the Lakers. Um, do you... Uh, so what? how do you do this price, right? Because it's pretty interesting because you have to guess whether Anthony Davis is going to play or not. So, uh, and, and I don't think anyone really knows whether that's going to happen, even him. So... Yeah, a very, very difficult series. And, and like you say and allude to, very lots of subjective um, views that we really don't know the answer to. And I'm not sure we'll ever find the answer out. How healthy is Chris Paul? You know, if AD plays, how healthy is he? It's a groin. We know historically that's a really difficult injury to kind of stress test without putting yourself in game position. And, you know, we, we think that Andy Davis is pretty badly hurt. And even if we see him, we don't believe that he'll have a whole lot of capacity relative to his ability. So um, 
right now our rough projections with all those doubts is that we think this game could be pick em if we get to a game seven. Right now, the probability that we're coming out with, I think, is uh, 28% for the Lakers and 72% for the Suns. I think our price at minus 290 is almost exactly on that. So, um, yeah, it's just a very difficult series for us to be too bullish about because of all the unknowns that you allude to. And the problem is you can't be bullish on the series. You can't have a great assumption of how things will play out, but you're going to get a lot of money on it because obviously there are a lot of eyes on this series. In this series specifically, given the, the Paul injury and the Davis injury, it feels like it's one that is probably going to be a lot higher pressure for you as a bookmaker to try to set the right line. Has it been stressful trying to you know sort through all that information and make those adjustments while taking on a lot of money, I'd assume, for this series the entire time? Yeah, I mean, we spoke about it before, Jim. We're lucky that, you know, we don't get too much pressure and noise on a daily basis. I don't have to walk with my head down in the corridor when we've had a losing <laughs> night. And, you know, our executive team are really balanced when it comes to that. And the scale of our business means that we don't need to sweat results as maybe some smaller books might have to. So I wouldn't say there's added pressure. Obviously, we're trying to, you know, set the best number we can. Fundamentally, that's what our job is. Uh, we take a lot of pride in that. And I think we do a good job with it. But um yeah, I think this one is just one of them that you put in the edge case and you say it's just so difficult. No one really knows the answer. I think we lean a little bit more on the market consensus for a game like this and a series like this than we would for other games where we have more facts in front of us. Uh, and I think that's the right approach. I think the betters, like I said, are posed with the same problem. So I don't expect anyone out there to feel too sorry for us. Yeah, equal footing is always uh, nothing we can complain too much about there. Let's talk about NHL and talk about the Stanley Cup finals. Uh, we have the Avalanche at plus 150 to win the Stanley Cup right now. <clears throat> Do you see any realistic contenders for the Avalanche in the Stanley Cup, or uh, do you think that they've got a pretty firm advantage here? I uh, like their odds imply they've got a pretty firm advantage. Um, they're obviously really good, and they're obviously really fun to watch as well. Um, we just feel like I think we're about the best price in the market at plus 150, though. I think our true probability is a little bit higher, probably more higher, uh, probably higher than I might like to admit, to be honest. Uh, and we're look in terms of the matchup, in terms of these teams, Colorado Avalanche are the best team in NHL. I think everybody knows that their odds imply it. Uh, I think Tampa Bay is the team that we really do think can put it up to the Avalanche, though. I think we're plus 240. There might be as big as three to one out there. So we're using a lot of our um, over round that we're giving away on Colorado versus the market and keeping it on Tampa Bay. Uh, so we think it's probably more like a two horse race there with the with the two of those really kind of setting the edge and and think that Tampa Bay are really the team that can only challenge Colorado, but looks to be obviously um, Colorado in, in pole position right now at least. Awesome. And John, we also want to talk to you about the Belmont. Uh, it's a race that's being back up to 1.5 miles, uh, known for being the longer race, which I kind of enjoy as a distance runner. Uh, break down this field for us compared to, uh, you know, the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. Yeah, look, it's, it's a difficult race to handicap from that perspective, obviously back up to a mile and a half uh, and running its regular slot, which is great for Belmont. And, you know, we've an impressive winner coming from Pimlico with Ron Bauer. Uh, for Mike McCarthy, he looked like he enjoyed the trip. Uh, he looks like he'll relish extra ground in the Belmont, but I'm not sure about the race flow with uh, Pimlico. He's one I'm looking to, exp uh, to to oppose. He's probably going to be in the 5-2 to two range, and uh, yeah, he can win. Of course he can. He was impressive the last day, but I I'd try and look look for someone, someone else. I think Rock the World is probably an interesting horse. He got badly hampered from a wide gate in the Kentucky Derby. He's had the rest since, didn't run in the Preakness, and he looks like the obvious leader with Joel Rosario for John Sadler out of the seven hole. He'll probably be about four to one. I don't think we're getting a ton of value on him, but I'd rather take a shot with him being maybe potentially able to wire the field and get onto an easy lead in a race where a lot of them are probably reluctant uh, to go forward and try and conserve energy for the last. So I'll take a stab with him. Not a race of a whole lot of confidence in, though, to be honest. The favorite looks like he'll be the two horse essential quality. He missed the derby through injury. Looks a really talented horse. He's back on track now for Godolphin. He's a right, justifiable favorite, but again, he's going to be too short for me. So I'll just take a chance with the seven. And I do want to ask you about the rest component because obviously with, uh, with the Belmont being back to where it was previously, it's a pretty grueling trip to go Derby, Preakness, and Belmont in such a short span. 
Do you tend to find yourself favoring horses that may have had a break at some point in there and may not be on their third high pressure race in such a, uh, a short window? Yeah, it's really obviously a grueling uh, task to be set to, to run these three races in, in, in six weeks or so. Um, I think, you know, you saw the benefit of Ron Bauer not running in the Derby when he ran in, in the Preakness uh, and the favorite doing the opposite, winning the Derby uh, and then obviously disappointing slightly running third in, in Pimlico. Uh, yeah, I, I think the answer is yes. I think the other key consideration is this race is just very different. The first two legs are really centered around speed and they're trained in a different way, whereas this race is getting a horse to relax and switch off and being able to finish out the race strongly. So probably looking for a different type of a race horse, usually at Belmont outside of, you know, obviously the triple crown horses and, and, and you know, the the likes of Pharaoh and, and and horses like that that were able to, you know, just jump out on the lead and set easy fractions. They probably faced inferior opposition. If I had a horse, I wouldn't fear any of the top two here. And particularly, like you said, if I'm coming off a break, I'd be happy enough taking some of these on. And I think Rock the World with the break, he didn't have the race that he probably wanted to have in in in, um, in the Derby. And, and obviously missing the Preakness now having a six week rest coming here fresh and maybe able to get on the lead is probably one of the main reasons why I kind of take a chance with him. Now, you mentioned you'll be hopefully at the Belmont this weekend. Is it nice for you to kind of kick back? Because obviously, FanDuel Racing is a separate arm effectively from you. Is it nice for you to just kind of kick, kick back and enjoy sports where you're not, you know, worrying about job stuff <laughs> at the same time? You know what? I, I'm pretty good at switching off. I mean, managed to get to, I think, all three of the Brooklyn games at home. And I don't worry too much about, you know, you know the results in terms of how it affects our profitability. But... Uh, I just love horse racing. I just think it's an incredible side. I love the challenge of trying to handicap it, and I love the kind of real-time feedback that you get, both setting odds and, and wagering on it. So I think it's one of the unique sports that you kind of get that real-time feedback on if you were wrong or right within you know two minutes. And I think that's one of the unique selling points for me, and you know the spectacle that it is, and the athletes, both the jockeys and the and the animals on the course. So. Uh, yeah, I definitely enjoy it a lot, but like I said, I'm pretty good at switching off and forgetting about work when I'm at a sporting event, regardless of what the outcome might be for the book. Yeah, the two-minute sweat is much nicer than a four-hour NASCAR <laughs> race where you're slowly realizing how wrong you were. So I will, uh, I'll take that for sure. That is John Sheeran. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at jsheeran1981, uh, and make sure you check out the lines at FanDuel Sportsbook as well. John, we appreciate, as always, your transparency and your time. Thank you for coming on, and have fun at the Belmont this week. Thank you, guys. Have a great weekend. You as well. Thanks, appreciate John. it. Thank you. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to John Sheeran for swinging by and breaking down the process behind bookmaking throughout the NBA and NHL playoffs and also talking some horse rating, getting uh, getting John's thought there. Still got some uh, bonus money in my TVG account, so we'll have to work on that and see what we have uh, for this weekend. But, Ed, John went through his thoughts on Suns Lakers, and it sounds yeah. like you want to talk about that for covering the future as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's just been interesting. So, you know, last week I talked about home court in the NBA. And in some sense, this is going to be kind of a covering the past about that supposed yeah. analysis that that home court should be about three points in, in the NBA playoffs. Um, and then just looking, I, I just kind of got intrigued because I've been trying to figure out, um, I, I, don't, I don't really, I didn't run an NBA model this year. So, I've been actually trying to use the markets to figure out, well, what do the markets think the spread should be? So, you know, I mean, you can kind of back out what the markets think, uh, which team is better on a neutral court, which I can put into a model and calculate with a home court and calculate what should be the win probability at this point. And, th and then you can compare that to the series price at FanDuel. So when you're looking at the Phoenix series, um, you know, game one was at Phoenix. Suns were a two and a half point favorite. Both teams were healthy. So this might actually be the clearest picture of of what uh, what these two teams are full strength. Uh, game two, the Lakers were actually a two point favorite, and that was a huge swing because Chris Paul was hurt. Um, there might have been a little bit of an extra push towards the Lakers because they were down one zero uh, in the series at that point. Game three, Chris Paul's back. Uh, everyone's essentially healthy, and the Lakers were a six and a half point favorite at home. Uh, they were both. That was for both game three and game four. Um, Anthony Davis got hurt during the game in ga game four, so that should not be reflected in uh, what that market closed at. Obviously, game five is going to reflect uh, the Anthony Davis injury, and the Suns went up to a four and a half point favorite on their on their home court. And then. 
Uh, we still kind of expect Anthony Davis to be out, I think, and the Lakers are about a two-and-a-half-point favorite at this point uh, at FanDuel. I think uh, there's there's more juice to bet the Lakers at, at minus two-and-a-half right now. So, obviously, this is the line's been all over the place because of key injuries to, to Chris Paul and Anthony Davis. Um, you can probably get a reasonable estimate for the teams at full strength if you look at the differences between Game 1 and Game 3, uh, which were relatively healthy. So... You know, if you do that, um, you would see that the Lakers were would be considered better by two points on a neutral court, right? And so, and you can kind of use that to say, well, if Anthony Davis comes back, you know, Lakers should be uh, are two points better, um, and that would give you uh, the Suns about a sixty nine percent chance to uh, win. Uh, excuse me, a seventy nine percent chance. If, if Davis is healthy, if Davis is not healthy, you can kind of look at the differences between game um, five and six to figure out what they should be on a neutral court. And they would suggest that Phoenix is better by about a point. Um, and so this would be about a 69 percent uh, win probability. So the difference. Look, the Lakers are definitely behind the eight ball here. Right. So they're down three two. They need to win two in a row. They're not likely to win this series. Um, but the difference if Anthony Davis is around they're their win probability is going to jump about 10% in this series. So, and you know, not surprisingly, FanDuel is exactly splitting this difference. You know, minus 290 for Phoenix to win is a break-even probability of 74%, which is exactly in the middle. Now, if you notice, like when I've been talking about this, um, you know, the difference between Suns by two and a half points and Lakers by six and a half points, both on their home court, is actually a difference of nine points. Um, that would imply a home court of four and a half points, which is something I would have used like eight years ago uh, <laughs> in the NBA playoffs before home court has has drastically decreased. Uh, and honestly, right now, like if you look at the numbers, you know, with without Anthony Davis in games five and six, now now we're looking at a difference of about seven points. Um, so the spreads are all over the ca- place in this series. Uh, that's certainly not to say the market is wrong because it's not giving me a home court of three. Um, the home court of three has – the markets have, like, confirmed that in some of these closer series, uh, Denver, Portland, Atlanta, New York. Um, the difference has been exactly six in, in those spreads. So, yeah, this series has been all over the place. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting. I don't really have a take as to whether Anthony Davis will play or, or which team I like more, but I thought it was inter- interesting to, to kind of look at the analytics and, and what the win probabilities say in ter- based on the, the point spreads in the series. Well, it's important, too, because – People will have more information when they listen to this podcast and they can decide based on the data you mentioned, like, okay, we know Anthony Davis is out or we know Anthony Davis is in. They can go then decide based on the numbers you gave out, which I feel like is equally actionable information to have. Yeah, hopefully. So, I mean, you have to have a take if you're going to act on this, but, but this is what, this is what the markets would say based on the, the, the spreads. I'm hoping for a game seven at least just because uh, it's been an interesting series. I'd like to see a healthy Anthony Davis. We're probably not going to get that for this series, but like yeah. healthy, healthy. But I would like to see more action. It's been a fun series so far. So hopefully more action, healthier versions of each team. We'll see how things play out later on this week. For my cover in the future, I want to go back to NASCAR this week and talk about Joey Logano because the Cup Series is heading to Sonoma, which is a road course. And it's their third road course race the regular season. Logano has been a pretty constant presence at the front of the field, but he's not being treated as such from an odds perspective. So I want to bet him across the board for this weekend. The reasoning here is that his road course abilities have really ticked up recently. He has four straight top tens in road courses uh, for points paying races dating back to last year. But if you count the Bush Clash, which was an exhibition, he actually has four straight podium finishes on road courses. He was third at Circuit of the Americas two weeks ago, second at the Daytona Roval, third at the Bush Clash, also in Daytona, second at the Charlotte Roval last year. He had a top eight average running position in all three of the points-paying races, so he didn't fluke his way there. He was running up front the entire race and finished well. So he's good on the road courses, and his form in the 750 horsepower package is good too. He ranks third in the current form section of my model, which just looks at the 750 tracks so far this year. When you add that with his road course prowess, Logano ranks fourth overall in my model. So I want to bet him. The problem is that Chase Elliott and Martin Truex Jr. suck up a lot of the win equity at this track, and he has to beat them. He hasn't done that yet, so 
What I want to do here is split this one up. I want to lay down two units on Logano. The first unit goes to entirely his top 10 odds at minus 175. I think that's a good bet by itself. So if you don't want to deal with Truex and and, uh, Elliott, just bet him top 10. I think that's totally fine. The second unit is going to be split in half between his podium odds and his win odds. The podium odds are plus 400 at FanDuel Sportsbook. His win odds are 16 to 1. This does mean I need him to podium to profit still, so there is that. But my win simulations show that there is value in all three of these markets. The win market, the podium market, and the top 10 market. The biggest value is in the outright. He's simulated 8.6% to win versus 5.9% implied. It is the biggest outright value I have for this week. But with Shrex and Elliott being so good on this track type, I'm okay taking the less quote-unquote valuable route and going with Logano uh, to podium and finish top 10 here. The other thing too is my model cannot get to the numbers Truex and Elliott have. Like there are Elliott's at like implied 30%. I'm not going to get there with my simulations. I just, I can't, I can't find a way to make him look that good in my model. So I do want to account for that and discount and say that Logano's simulated win odds may be a bit higher than they should be. So to me, it's one unit on Logano to finish top 10 at minus 175, half unit each in the podium and the outright. There is value in all three markets. So whatever your flavor may be, if you want to go podium, sweet. If you want to go top 10, sweet. The data does back it up. You could go to out, win, it, win outright too, but I would say again, I can't get Elliot and Truex as high as their their implied odds, so it's going to make other people look naturally more valuable. Uh, but I do think that Logano for the podium and the top 10 is going to be the way I want to play things for this week. Ed, I wanted to ask you, though, because it seems like there are some situations where no matter how we look at things, we can't get to the number. Like, sometimes... I don't know if it's like uh, the Patriots, like uh, back yeah. in their heyday, where Alabama they would just football. be like monster favorites, like against the Dolphins a couple years ago. We can't get our numbers to match that. What do you do in the situations where you know things are probably more probable than your model has, but you still can't get to what the betting number is? Because it, to me, the issue is that it creates seeming value elsewhere that might not actually be there. What do you mean seeming value elsewhere? Because like if my win simulations have 100% allocation and they can't right. get to 30% on Chase Elliott, that means right. that I got him at 15%. That's half. Like that's 15 right. percentage points of value that are lingering for other people. But like right. I know Chase Elliott's true win odds are probably higher than 15%. Yeah, I mean I think you just just need to be thoughtful about it. I mean you need to the markets are going to uh, you know they're going to put a couple extra points on the favorite like in Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's just going to happen because, uh, you know, that's what the market says the price should be. Uh, so, you know, I mean, if uh, there's, a, there's always kind of an Alabama factor, right. And, right. and, you know, com- my model compared to what they do. So, uh, I don't know. I think that's where you just have to be mindful that, you know, your model isn't perfect and, and know that it might struggle a little bit in with, with some of these big favorites and that doesn't, you know, doesn't mean the market's right. Doesn't mean your model's wrong. Um, just have to be careful about that. And that's the goal here with the Logano splitting the markets and trying sure. to navigate my way around that. So Joey Logano, a guy I want to bet this week, just be cautious, uh, given that Elliot and Truex are lurking and always waiting to snatch a win at a road course. That is all the time that we have for this week here on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to John Sheeran of FanDuel Sportsbook for swinging by, breaking down NBA and NHL playoffs in the Belmont this week. Hope John has a fantastic time at the Belmont. Follow John on Twitter at jsheeran1981. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, I had a really interesting conversation with Dan Zimborski uh, about oh, baseball. Nice. It is not up yet, but it will be soon. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool to talk to him. Uh, we kind of expanded on some of the things that we talked with him uh, this time last year and his player projections. And he made me really jealous of all the data that they have on baseball players, even though it's far from perfect. Um, but Dan's a really interesting guy. Uh, he did not give me kind of the stock answers. Uh, his 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 uh his favorite book and who he'd like to have dinner with were very interestingly not what you would expect. So yeah, yeah it was a lot of fun. 
And then uh, I've, I've definitely been trying to keep up uh, at least one newsletter a week uh, with my newsletter at the Power Rank, uh, looking at NBA and golf this time of year, and certainly going to be turning that focus on football uh, as we get into August. So uh, check that out at thepowerrank.com. If you follow Dan Zimborski on Twitter, you will not be surprised that he would have unconventional answers to those questions. He's a really interesting guy, really good dude too to talk to. Um, yeah. Very willing to donate his time. Like even when I was doing small town radio in Minnesota, he still came on and he talked about the twin Ziff's projections. So uh, I'll check that out <laughs> once it's up. Uh, Dan Zimborski, really fun guy. Check that out over at the Football Analytics Show and check out Ed's stuff at the uh, the Power the Power and check out Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald. Our our video producer for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you uh, with your bets, whether it be for the NBA or NHL playoffs or for the Belmont or NASCAR this week. And we'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Aaron Dolan here. Thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great FanDuel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here.